Good day, everyone. Welcome to I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist, the podcast. I'm Troy, one of your hosts, and the other host here is Mr. Brian. Let's call me Mr. Brian. All right, Mr. Brian. Far better than Pastor Brian. Yeah, I'll stick with that probably for about another three seconds, and then it'll just go back to Brian. So, Brian, why don't you introduce our guest? Look, I'm excited. I'm always excited about our guests, but I'm excited about our guest today because this this guest, Dave Andrews, we have introduced a few episodes ago that we're going to pretend, oh, sorry, maybe have not on our Facebook page, we're going to have Dave on. And really exciting, I used to be involved in, T- it used to be called Tear Fund, now it's more so it's just referred to as Tear, and Dave was a, a familiar speaker, writer, inspiration in that space. But Dave, I've, I've looked at your website and you're described in so many different ways you've got a raft of different bios you've you're described as a christian community worker an extraordinary risk taker a mango milkshake maker a man on the margins and a -a one-of-a-kind uncontainable uncategorizable by uh, a friend of the podcast brian mclaren so tell us you're all those things but who is Dave Andrews, how would you describe yourself? G'day, guys. Uh, uh, thanks for inviting me to have uh, this time with you and have a bit of a chat. I guess you, I introduce myself to different people in different ways because you're always looking for a way of linking who you are with who you're relating to. So I would use a range of ways of introducing myself depending on who I'm talking to. I mean, it's, it's really interesting how I became profoundly disillusioned with Christianity as a religion and began to deliberately not describe myself as a Christian, just say I'm a follower of Jesus, until 9-11 and, uh, and this conflict arose between Christians and Muslims. And Muslims were looking for a Christian that they could relate to. And uh, I happened to be the nearest one available that they felt comfortable to relate to. So after many years of not describing myself as a Christian, but as a follower of Jesus, I found myself in a position where it was important for them, for me to introduce myself to them as a Christian, because it gave them a sense, hey, we've got a connection here with somebody from that community, and it helped build a bridge for them. So that's a classic example of um, how uh, that language can change and the way you actually describe yourself in different situations might change. I'm often referred to as a Christian anarchist because I have a very strong critique of structures and systems that are hierarchical and that are often very oppressive and exploitative. And I um, I deliberately look at for ways to subvert those systems to create space for people, particularly at the bottom, to find room to breathe, room to move, and actually realise some of their potential as human beings that's often been oppressed in the name of religion. And uh, so, um, yeah, I'm happy to, at different times, adopt all those uh, kind of different descriptions of myself. So, Dave, can I ask you, what's your backstory? Where did where did you come into contact with Christianity? Were you born into it? Did you have a conversion experience? Uh, my father was a Baptist pastor, so I was nurtured within a, a very conservative uh, Baptist tradition. But my father was a Baptist from England, had more of an affinity to the Anabaptists, so had that kind of experience of the tradition that was spiritual, um, voluntary, it was participatory, it was non-conformist, it was committed to peace and simplicity. So that, that was a great tradition to come from. And my mother and father were people who had a spirituality that transcended their theology. So they, they, they had a, an experience of God as a God of love which they internalized and then externalized in the way they related to each other. They were always hugging uh, in the kitchen, walking down the street hand in hand. Uh, They would embrace us as children and we had an open home. They encouraged us to open up a home to other people who are in need. Uh, So I experienced um, the Christian tradition through my, as it was represented by my parents 
as an experience of love and one that actually I found myself immersed in as a child. That became a primary way of framing my approach to life. That uh, They called me David, which is meant to be the beloved, and I felt loved and I have sought to live my life out of that love that my, I experienced in my genesis, even though along the way I've deconstructed and reconstructed my framework for understanding of the faith along the, along the road. So, Dave, I want to pick up on, you, you said the phrase, a spirituality that transcended their theology. Tell us a little bit more about that. What, what does that mean? I sometimes teach, teach courses around... Um, religion and uh, and comparative religion and of course the subject of spirituality often comes up and how it is compared or contrasted with religion so my my kind of working definitions are that spirituality is an experience of and an expression of a spirit of compassion for the other whereas my definition of religion is Religion is the ideation of an experience and an institutionalization of an expression of that spirit of compassion that simultaneously negates as well as affirms that reality in our lives. So my understanding of spirituality that I experience in my tradition but in many religious traditions, is one of an experience of of compassion that that people express in really uh, beautiful, noble be- uh, ways. And but I experience that not only inside my tradition, but in other traditions and in other people who come from no religious tradition at all. But I see that within all religions, there's both the the positive and negative, the the the, the stories and rituals that affirm that but also the stories and rituals that negate it. So there's an inherent tension within every religion around that kind of spirituality that it uh, simultaneously affirms and negates. Does that make sense to you at all? It does. It does. So I I hear you saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, I hear you saying that on the one hand, the, the religion is propagating, putting forward this spirituality, yet at the same time, it's, it's an enemy of it because of the structures, because of the hierarchies, because of whatever. Yeah, so me growing up within a Christian tradition, what was affirmed to me was the enchanting, radical, compassionate spirituality uh, of compassion that Jesus embodied, that I still find I'm inspired by. But at the same time, the construction of Christianity as a religion was so antithetical to that radical... (laughs) Uh, spirit of compassion that Jesus embodied that I often describe Christianity as the Antichrist. So it's not just a variation of of what Christ was on about. It's it's actually the opposite of it. If if you want to look, you know, Jesus says, you see the way the what do you call it, the Gentiles boss other people around, it shall not be so amongst you. Right? So to me that's a that's an immediate strict and clear critique of every Christian structure that I know of, which is hierarchical. Uh, And he calls for mutuality uh, and reciprocity. So it seems to me that the very structure of Christianity as a religion is the antithesis of what Jesus was on about. You're making um, Jesus sound like a a socialist hippie, Dave. Is is that your intention? He's at least that. I'd like to think he's more than that. I mean, it's very interesting that... um, that many Christians see people who advocate for the poor and for the oppressed as being left-wing as opposed to right-wing. Why is it that we project that onto the left-wing uh, rather than the right-wing? I mean, I, I think that the, the beliefs I stand for are probably equally inimicable to both the left-wing and right-wing. But I was fortunate to grow up in the area of the Jesus Revolution in the late 60s, early 70s, where people were experimenting with alternative ways of living out our faith and started to develop intentional faith communities. And we actually joined communities like that. The first one we joined was a community called Dilaram in Kabul in Afghanistan. And that was a place 
that was trying to provide hospitality for people on the way from Europe to Asia who got into trouble, you know, the world travellers. Most of the people in that community were people who had been hippies or freaks. And so it was very much the subculture uh, of that place. And the spirituality of that group, the values and the culture of that group were wonderful because people took the Sermon on the Mount seriously and tried to live it out. And so it was kind of like the uh, like a hippie community in Kabul where the people weren't perpetually stoned and were reasonably healthy and had the energy to help other people. And uh, so that was my start of my uh, intentional community uh, experience and it was formative. It, it's quite an amazing story you had, which we want to unpack some of those as, as we sort of move on, Dave. But how did you get to that point? I mean, we'll touch on this, but, you know, you've you lived and worked in Pakistan. You've talked about Afghanistan, Nepal, India. You know, you, you've worked in all those places. But what was the lead up to that? Like, who was Dave Andrews in his late teens, early 20s? Like, what led you to, to really be attracted to this space? And And I guess I want to pick up on you're talking about the Jesus community. When we spoke to Brian McLaren recently, Brian, and I know you know Brian, and, and Brian spoke about how some of that was quite a fundamentalist movement. Now, not all of it was, and there was some real freedom in some of it, but people's experience of it were different. So how did you get to that place where you saw it as a, a liberating move away from that religion and into more of a spirituality? Okay, so just to back up, I mean... I became a conscious believer in Jesus from a very early age, so so early that I can't remember when they made that choice. But all through primary school and secondary school, I sought to to follow the example of Jesus and tried to, to practice that in the way I related to kids in school. So well, just trying to find kids that were more marginalised, the least of these, as Jesus would say, looked for a way to include them in groups, defended them when they were attacked. And because I was a follower of Jesus, I was uh, committed to not only non-dominance, but non-violence. And so I, I actually stood up for those kids non-violently and often got beaten to a pulp, sometimes taken away and rushed to hospital from some of the beatings I got. But it was all through school, a really serious commitment to follow the way of Jesus to work that out in the context in which I found myself. When I went to university in the late 60s, early 70s, that was the time of counterculture. That was the time where the Jesus movement was a subset of that counterculture. Uh, I was, found out about this community called Dilaram and, uh, in Kabul. We just bought a house and I was going to be teaching at Brisbane State High uh, just down the road. But Angie and I read part in the gospel where Jesus says to a rich young person like us, sell everything you have, give it to the poor and come and follow me. So we sold everything, gave everything away, literally everything. And we went to uh, Dilaram in Kabul. Now, in those early days, it was open, uh, experimental, hospitable. And we, we, find, we found that really nurturing to us, and we went on from the house in um, in Afghanistan to open some houses in in India, and still be a part of that movement it was great. But a certain stage, Floyd McClung, who'd started Dilaram in Kabul, was contacted by Lauren Cunningham, who was in, who was the director of Youth with a Mission, and he wanted Floyd to come back and join Youth with a Mission um, as he was getting older and become the director. And uh, Floyd, Floyd found that a very attractive option, but then he had. Dilaram that he'd started in the meantime when he wasn't associated with YWAM. And there were a whole lot of us who had chosen to join Dilaram, not YWAM. We wanted to be part of this small, low-profile, hospitable community, not this big, fast-moving, evangelistic movement. We didn't want to be a part of that. So that there was a problem. And um, Lauren tried to pitch it as, you know, this is God's call for us to come together, you know, to unite these uh, kind of movements, uh, Dilaram and YWAM. And I, I got up and publicly opposed to that. And I, I critiqued the top-down system within YWAM. I uh, critiqued the use of uh, revelation as a means of domination, uh, where the Lord says this and that and uh, rationalizes the power structures. I critiqued the financial 
distribution because it was clear that, or even though the rhetoric was everybody pays to work with YWAM, once you got to a certain level of leadership, you could go and do talks at other YWAM bases and they'd give you a love gift. And that could be hundreds or thousands of dollars. So once you had made it up the hierarchy to a certain stage, you could get paid and paid quite a lot of money. And I critiqued that. They they tried to assuage my criticisms by inviting me to be a member of the international leaders uh, YWAM. There was a clear clear op- option to to acquire more wealth as a part of that process and uh, more power and more prestige. But I spoke out against it and. Um, Lauren flew in from overseas and publicly prophesied against me as a as a communist, and I was formally excommunicated. I was put out on the street with my wife. Everybody was forbidden to talk to me. Uh, everybody who who was associated with YWAM was told that that if they gave me shelter, they would be excommunicated as well. So I found myself out on the street, uh, homeless, with Nearly all the people that I had lived and worked with for the last five years literally turning their backs on me and and completely abandoning me. So that became one of the most formative experiences in my life. That's how I went from the the, the mellow, charismatic, open, uh, experimental community to, to face the harsh, hard reality that was operating within that context. Dave, so let me ask you, what year was was that? What year did that happen? Uh, I think probably about 75. Yeah, okay. So it was in 1975 that you were critiquing the structures of, of an organisation like YWAM and they not only kicked you out but they threatened other people who continued to connect with you. They also threatened to excommunicate them. Yes, that's right. And they and they actually sent delegations to other places in the world where I had contacts and uh, and asked the people in those local churches to have nothing to do with me. So they completely tried to deliberately destroy all my options. It's just it's just funny to hear that, I have to say, because I would have thought, and obviously wrongly, that back in those early days it would have been so much less less harsh, less intense, but actually the opposite is true. Well, it seems more soft and mellow until you threaten the structures that are there supporting that culture. Once you start to threaten that that structure, then they come down heavy and hard. Mm. So you're out on the streets, Dave. Yeah, literally. Yeah, literally on the streets. It's you and Anne, your wife. My wife and my daughter. Yeah, and what's your daughter's name? Uh, her name's Von. Yvonne. Von. So, so you're out in the streets with Ange and Yvonne. What the hell? What, what, what do you do from there? This was a very traumatic time. So, uh, as I'm talking to you, it's, I'm already beginning to experience the feelings from all those years ago. Um, well, it was difficult because everybody I'd looked up to had denounced me. The community that I'd been a part of, that I'd been a leader in for a few years, had disavowed me. I didn't only lose those people. I lost my purpose, uh, my my employment, everything all at once. And um, the challenge for me then is how was I going to do with that? Fortunately, so, <laughs> fortunately, one family that had been a part of Dilaram, a guy who'd been a junkie that had become a, a believer and had, had uh, now started to be involved with really constructive ways of uh, working in the community. He offered, he and his wife offered us a place to stay. Uh, It was actually in the red light district of Amsterdam. So we were actually, we lived in their little place for a while on top of a brothel and uh, across the road from a big triple X sex theatre that blasted out the soundtrack to their porno movies. So all the time you'd be hearing People go, oh, 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 oh. the Richard Cassendo, the whole place would be shaking because of the, the power of their speakers. And then you kind of recover again and try to drink your cup of tea. And then they'd start all over again because that's all there was, a whole series of orgasms. So we'd be there and if anybody came to visit us, we'd just be trying to drink our teas without our 
the cups rattling on our uh, saucers. Anyway, while we were there, the challenge was, okay, how, how do we respond to all this? The first thing for me uh, was to acknowledge that their criticism might have been right. Okay. What, I, what if I am a self-righteous bastard that's just ambitious and wanting to overthrow their leader to become the leader myself? So I had to critically reflect on myself. I had to acknowledge that though, though their construction of my ambition was false, I had to acknowledge that there was an arrogance there that I needed to deal with. So that was, that was the first thing I did. I needed to deal with that arrogance so that I, I could learn to confront in a much more tactful manner in future. So that's one. The second thing I did was say, look, this is me failing at my best. Look, I'm 25 years of age. I've started communities in India. I'm, I've been appointed to lead these communities in Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, and Nepal at the age of 25. And now I've failed, not at my worst, but at my best. So unless I find a faith that relates to failure, I've got no faith at all that's relevant. And then I realized that, in fact, most people in the world struggle uh, with being crushed. And so, in fact, if I could use this experience to find a faith that related to, to failure, then I was going to find a faith that was relevant to most people who were struggling and who found themselves seeking to realize their potential but constantly found themselves oppressed. So that was the second thing I, I really tried to work out. The third thing was to say, okay, I could try and demonize YWAM, which would have been very easy to do, but then I may have missed the point. The point was most Christian organizations operate like that, ostensibly good people in good groups who do bad things to people. How do they do that? And then I realized that it's because they have a hierarchical structure. Uh, where everybody's accountable to the person above them, except the person at the top who's accountable to nobody but God, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And once you've got a structure like that, you've got no mutual accountability, no checks and balances in those systems. So I said, from now on, every group or organization I'm going to be a part of, I'm going to help construct a community where there's genuine mutuality, where there's real checks and balances. And where I avoid becoming like them by not seeking to be in a primary leadership role, but to actually have rotating leadership roles in which I could play along with everybody else, which is what I did. And those three resolutions that came out of that have uh, shaped the way I've lived my life ever since. David, I was going to say it's an incredibly powerful thing. So, you know, people on the podcast know I'm a social worker. You know, I certainly identify with a lot of the things that you're talking about, but talking about it and living it are two completely different things. It's it's a very difficult thing to do and we can talk the talk, but you're talking about walking the walk and not only are you uh, you're self-reflecting, you're really examining yourself and going, what part did I play in something or what part can I play in making this world a better place? And that self-criticism is such an incredibly powerful thing. The thing that struck me, Dave, that when you were telling the story then was I was actually at, at a number of times when you're telling the story, thinking of myself as a young 20-something and thinking, I wanted to follow Jesus or I wanted to be a spiritual person, but the temptation to join the system, and that's what we called it, right? We called it the system. And the temptation to join the hierarchy, to get the suit and the tie and the church and the offering. And, you know, and, and I certainly failed at that many, many times. But I think the gift was when you got squeezed out. And and I tell a story in when I was kicked out of, uh, well, not kicked out of, excuse me, when I chose to leave what we call Great Big AOG, we don't name the church. But when I went to a dance recital and I was watching these two dancers in this box and they were dancing and they were sort of going over the top of each other above and below, above and below in this sort of circular motion. And they were fighting for dominance in this little box. And what happened was one of the dancers pushed the other one out of the box 
and in air quotes, won the box. But then what happened was that while being stuck in this box going round and round by themselves, the person that was kicked out started to dance and started to leap and started to move all around. And, and all of a sudden, the whole stage opened up to this one person that was kicked out, but they were actually more free. That, that was something that really spoke to me as I was going through that. And I just kept reflecting on that, to be honest, when you were telling those stories going, this is almost rite of passage, I think, for a lot of people. When they join a religious organization, they get squeezed out and then they find themselves. Some too. Uh, other people ended up in psychiatric institutions as a result of these uh, excommunications um, because the loss is so great. I was fortunate to have the background of my parents' love and the faith that they had shared with me that was expressed in terms of a deep sense of being loved that sustained this incredible rejection. I mean, because it's not just happened then. I mean, I've been excommunicated or kicked out or uh, cut off from at least a dozen church and parachurch organisations that where the same things happened to me. What has sustained me is my existential experience of the love of God in Jesus that has given me a sense that in spite of being uh, totally rejected, I'm not uh, completely of no value at all. In fact, I, I was tempted to kill myself after this because the rejection was so great. I, my heart was broken and I felt a pain in my chest every time I met somebody from YWAM, I'd physically shake. And for me, it was finding somehow in God and in the kind of person of Jesus, a compassionate, embracing presence that helped sustain me. Um, so I didn't kill myself. And I was able to experience not just that rejection, but ongoing rejection as I engaged <laughs> institutions, not just religious institutions, but secular institutions and challenged those systems as well. In fact, one of my greatest achievements in life has been when, because all of those institutions that kicked me out after a period of 10 years have invited me back. Uh, it's very fascinating. And the, my greatest achievement is that when they've invited me back, I've been able to hear them on the phone saying, Dave, I wonder whether you could come back and do some work for us. You know, completely ignoring the way that they treated me or acknowledging how traumatic that was for me. But, oh, could you come back? We just need somebody to come and help us with this. Run this course on how we can minister to the poor and needy. And I could hear myself saying on the phone, sure, anything I can do to help you, I'd be happy to. And when I put the phone down, I would weep that I'd been able to do my inner work so well I could go back into these places where people had deliberately tried to destroy me and destroy my life and find something creative and constructive to do in that context. Now, that's, that's, that's not a public response. That's a private response. Most people don't even know that that's true of me. But that's been my greatest achievement in my life, I think. As empowering as that can be, Dave, that must be incredibly painful too. Very painful. Yeah, but that's the challenge, to live with the pain. Um, I'm, are you familiar with the Enneagram? So in the Enneagram, I'm an eight. So you know, my natural default position is to confront. The challenge for me is to experience the pain without reacting or retaliating. That's the challenge for me. That's the, the core spiritual challenge for me, to, to actually live with the agony, to hold it, without allowing the pain to impel me to act on it in inappropriate ways just to relieve myself of the pain. That's been the challenge. What drives that? What, what is it that inspires you, that, that drives you to actually act in that way? That it, it, it's, it's countercultural. Well, it's countercultural. It's counterintuitive. I mean, it's counter to my particular personality type you know so um well i keep coming back to the person of jesus who embodies that kind of cruciform radical spirituality 
If it wasn't for Jesus, I think God would be the devil if God was there at all. Je Jesus is, um, is the one that gives me faith in the possibility of responding otherwise. But, but I guess, Dave, overwhelmingly, this isn't the Jesus that we're presented with in the world. This isn't the Jesus that we hear from 95% of Christians. It's, it's about self-interest. It's about climbing the ladder. It's about being successful. Why, why is that Jesus so prominent? And why is your Jesus right? <laughs> well, it's easy to understand why that Jesus is prominent because um, there, was, there was just recent research done on why white evangelicals in America support Trump. And the research showed is because he hated the same people they did. If, if we can construct a Jesus who hates the same people that we do, and it's very interesting at the moment the way Christians in Australia are defining themselves over against a gender minority, you know, and they're, they're framing their Christian faith in terms of their rejection of gender minorities because they, they want a Jesus that hates the same people that they do. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, that, that's very attractive, isn't it? Whereas the Jesus I encounter in the, in the Gospels is a Jesus who calls me to love those who hate me, to um, bless those who abuse me, who, who's saying, hey, look, we're caught up in a cycle of violence in this world. And if we keep treating people the way that they treat us, we're just going to destroy ourselves. This Jesus instead, instead says, don't treat them the way they treat you. Treat them the way you'd like to be treated. That is the revolution, what I call the blessed uh, Beatitude Revolution. That's a, the, the revolution of Jesus. And I, I see it as the only way to prevent us from destroying ourselves. Now, when I say that, I, I see glimpses of that in all traditions and religions, not just in Christianity. And when I'm working with people of other traditions and religions, I look for that which is coming from a Christian perspective, that which is Christ-like within their traditions, and I affirm that, and I acknowledge that, and I celebrate that, and I collaborate with that, without necessarily um, naming Jesus at all. But Jesus is this kind of, I was going to say framework, it's not right, It's Jesus is this kind of hermeneutic, dynamic hermeneutic that's unleashed, that helps me to appreciate what is beautiful and noble in all traditions and frees me to affirm that and acknowledge that and collaborate with that. Unfortunately, unfortunately, often it's not Christians who reflect that. And I, I find it among other people that are, are not Christians that, that Christ-like spirituality is more evident in their lives. So, in fact, I don't normally use the, the language of Christians and non-Christians. For me, it's whether somebody's Christ-like or not that matters whether they're Christians or not. And, and that's a really interesting perspective, Dave. If someone is Christ-like, it doesn't matter if they're Hindu, whether they're Muslim, are they still demonstrating those attributes which you talk about, which essentially can be summed up in a very crass way, which is a very Brian way, don't be an arsehole. Be, be very much about looking after your fellow humans, your brothers, your sisters, just doesn't matter. Is that what you're saying? Are you saying that... Your, your Hindu friends, because I know I've, I've read some of your stuff where you talk about your Hindu friends, your Muslim friends, your Christian friends. They they lend that inspiration to you. Do they, are we all are we all bound for the same place? Well, if you want to take those different religions seriously, they will not say we're all bound to the same place. So, so you could it could be say it's said to be um, colonizing to say we're all bound for the same place. I don't know the answer to that question, but I know that. Many of those people would say, no, we are committed to this particular religion, not that religion, and we don't necessarily believe that we'll all end up the same way. But having said that, I believe that people can be better than their beliefs, <laughs> that we can all have a spirituality that's better than our theology. And even if our theological con constructs contradict one another, and when people are asked that question, are you bound for the same place, many of them would say, no, <laughs> we're not. <laughs> The idea of being with you forever is not an attractive option. In spite of that, a lot of people have a profound spirituality that uh, I believe reflects the God of love in whose image they are made, whether they believe in God or not. And so I think that's the important thing. I mean, if you look at Jesus uh, and his whole story of the Good Samaritan, I mean, 
the whole context of that is that he's critiquing the upholders of religious dogma and doctrine and actually saying, hey, this guy who you would reject as a heretic is a model of um, the ethic that I advocate because it's not about orthodoxy, it's about orthopraxis. And it's this person, because because essentially the gospel is God is love, then whoever reflects that love freely and faithfully in their lives uh, is, is somebody that Jesus honors and says, you know, that's what I, that's what I, I advocate. Whether they have a traditional or orthodox theology or not, I think that's what really matters. One of the things I said to Brian McLaren when he was on the other week, when I have connected with Buddhist teachers, and, and some of these are sort of high profile, at least in the Buddhist world, or whether I've connected with progressive Jews, whether I have connected with uh, even, you know, sort of more moderate Christians, a lot of the times I hear them saying the same thing. And when I asked Brian McLaren about that, I said, it, do, you know, do you think they're saying the same thing? And he said to me, no, I don't think they are, but I'll tell you, and, and that's what I'm reflecting on what you're saying or resonating with what you're saying. But he said, but they reach a point. It's like they drop down in the, in this, you know, I don't know what we want to call it, meditative, reflective spirituality. And when they drop down, they drop down into this central place where they are in the same place. So they may not be, the framework may not be saying the same thing, but they are saying, but they are somehow in the same place. And that's what I hear. You know, I hear a lot of these kind of, you know, whether it's your sort of your Richard Rory people or whether it's your Dalai Lama people or whether it's your, you know, Sharon Brach, or, you know, you hear these people saying a lot of the same things, but all from a different framework. That's right. And that's that's why I make the distinction between spirituality and religion and what I was saying about the ideation and institutionalization of that spirituality. But it's the spirituality that's the the, the really important thing. And it's that spirituality of compassion. I think that's really important. And 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 when people go to the depths of who they are, and from my theological framework, that is because we're made in the image of God. We're made by by a God of love, with love, for love. When we go to that place in the depths of who we are, really are, I, I believe we get in touch with that love and we sense our belovedness and we, we seek to love ourselves and then love others as we love ourselves. And that kind of spirituality, I think, is present in all traditions, all religions, and uh, incredibly beautiful. Yeah. Juxtaposed with the, the, you know, we all hate the same people. So we're all together, you know, and, and that's what we see a lot with, with, you know, fundamentalist Christianity, at least is, is, is there's a lot of hate, right? So, so looking at those two things, they are opposed. So my, my question I want to ask you is what are some of the broad themes that have seen you discarded, excommunicated by these groups of hate? What are some of the themes that you're, that you, you say, look, this is, this is who I am. This is what I stand for. So I think it's my critique of hierarchy for a start is <laughs> threatening to all institutions, whether they're religious or not. And my deliberate intentional advocacy of reframing all hierarchies in terms of mutuality of relationship, which subverts uh, the culture, if not the structures of those um, institutions. So that's, that's, to begin with, people don't mind that because I like you treating them as equal. It's only after a while they figure out the implications of this. This actually subverts their place within the system. You know what I mean? Uh, but when they find that out, then then, then uh, they can move from being very soft to being re really hard. So that's often been an issue, my critique of hierarchy um, and my call for mutuality and reciprocity. The, another issue is a belief that while I'm committed to my particular religious tradition, I don't believe my religion has a monopoly on the truth. And I believe God is bigger than my religion and that God can work through all people of all traditions and none. That's very threatening, particularly for people from my tradition, which is an evangelical, charismatic, Pentecostal tradition, where we were brought up to believe we had a monopoly on the truth. And in fact, all mission was about convincing other people they were wrong and that we were right. Huh? So... To, to have a belief that God is bigger 
than our religion, it kind of undermines the marketing <laughs> message where, you know, we're saying, you know, this is the truth, or as Francis Schaeffer said, this is the true truth. You've got to come to us to get the truth because you won't get it anywhere else. I mean, when you're saying that God is bigger than that and God can speak to people through all traditions and none, that, that undermines that marketing. Third thing is that belief, particularly in spirit. I mean, you guys come from a Pentecostal background, and um, I come from an evangelical background that, that doesn't emphasize spirit so much, but I'm a community worker by vocation and profession. And when I'm training Christians to do community work, I, I often say to them, you've got to remember that the spirit was there in creation, bringing order out of chaos. Where the spirit is, there is life. Wherever there is life, the spirit is now, you have been taught to identify the Spirit, the presence of the Spirit through using religious indicators, the baptism of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, and so on. But in Galatians, Paul says, he gives us the fruit of the Spirit as indicators of the presence of Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. I say, wherever you see those things in a community, it's a sign that the Spirit is at work in that community whether people say it's the Holy Spirit or whether it's team spirit or esprit de corps doesn't matter because the Spirit is God, uh, you know, incognito, not looking for attention, but just want to be involved in a, in a process that's not overpowering but empowering people, helping to, them to realise their potential individually and collectively. So I say to these, these community workers, um, Christian community workers, when you go out there, look for signs that the Spirit's already active. Your job is to acknowledge that, appreciate that, celebrate that, and collaborate with that. It doesn't begin and end with you. You know, set your agendas aside. You go into that situation and 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 work with what's happening there. It's happening. You know, work with it. No, no, and that's that's pretty threatening to a lot of people's missiology to to have that kind of framework. Last but not least, it's the it's the way that we have chosen to live our lives, having to chose us. I, I chose never to get a doctorate, never to get ordained, because I, I, I believe Jesus teaches against that stuff, you know, and about not seeking positions and power and titles. So I've deliberately not done that and deliberately placed myself on the margins um, of the church which um, to reach out to the people that are excluded to find ways of including them. And that's threatening to people too, because I'm then wanting to encourage them to relate to the people that they don't really want to relate to. As a community worker, they want me to come in and help them develop a community project that they can put on, that they can get government funding for and hire people to run on their behalf so they don't have to relate to those people themselves. And I keep saying, Listen, if you're trying to be a Christian community, you've got to be like Christ. And it says, uh, have this mind in you that was in Christ Jesus. He emptied himself to make space for people. It's not just about having a project to make you, you know, be great for your profile. You've got to be prepared to empty everything in your church that excludes these people in order to create a culture that includes them. And that's pretty threatening to people as well. So I think even the even the good music, Dave, and even the stages that they play the good music on, surely that couldn't go. Even the good music. Oh, I remember <laughs> going to the service, a big Pentecostal church, and they had a you know half hour worship session, and and at the end of it, um, I got on stage, and they said, um, I said, oh, that was great, wasn't it? And they said, yeah, and I said, oh. How many times did Jesus call us to worship him? And people were looking around at each other and not sure what to say. And eventually I say, none. He never asked people to worship him. Okay, there was that one occasion where Thomas fell before him and, and worshipped him, but Jesus never asked anybody to worship him. I said, oh, that's interesting. What did Jesus ask people to do? And then somebody will say, follow him. And I say, oh, okay, this is intriguing, isn't it? So. So Jesus says, I don't want you to treat me as a, a an idol and fall down before me and say how wonderful I am. I want you to treat me as a role model and actually ask whether uh, uh, you can follow in his footsteps. And the thing that he doesn't ask us to do is the thing that we do. And the thing that he asks us to do is the very thing that we don't do. 
Now, that's when the band got very agitated and decided to play, turn up the music and play it louder because it was very awkward for everybody. Yeah, some of the music's great, some of it's good. I mean, we actually write our own music because we've got a, we call it valley songs rather than hill songs that include recognition of faith but doubt, the struggle um, and so on. Uh, so so that the people can come to our little gathering and, and find songs that talk about what they're struggling with rather than trying to pretend that things are better than they are. I love that, valley songs. Yeah, that's really good. We should we should start singing some valley songs. I think we should. Songs of sorrow, songs of, of recognition. I'm listening to Dave talk and I'm thinking about, you know, the stories you tell of um, when we're at Great Big AOG and – they were sort of shunting the the street kids to to the back, you know, or, or one of the street kids who'd been coming along started dating one of the elders' daughters and, you know, all hell broke loose when that happened. But also if you think about, Brian, with, you know, the, some of the stories that we've told about standing up and saying, you know, why are you calling each other father and, you know, don't be called rabbi and, you know, and, and that was the beginning of the end of my time at Great Big AOG when I started saying that you know i i got hauled over the coals and told off yep. it's just funny hearing cuz cuz a lot of what you're talking about i'm actually reflecting back on our stories and going yeah that happened yeah that happened yeah that's right that happened yeah, but at the right. same time dave i don't want to i don't want to put us up as you know that we were the prophets because at the same time there was that tension and that pull and we were still trying to feather our own nest and we were still trying to get paid gigs in the church and happy to wear bugs bunny ties and the whole bit but I think you might be too self-deprecating. I mean, the reality is we all have the contradictions. We're all struggling with that. Well, like I made a really strong ethical choice when we started the Waiters Union not to name anything that we do with our name. So every group that we help organise in this neighbourhood, we encourage to name it for itself. So there's no, there's no indication in our community uh, in any activity, group or org- organisation that we may have facilitated, there's no indication that there's any relationship between that and us because the whole idea was to be servants, to resource, to support other people. But on a day when I feel unrecognised or underappreciated, I think if only we we'd named all of those things, <laughs> we would have got the uh, approbation uh, uh, of all this kind of community. I mean, we've helped develop multi-million dollar welfare organisations, but nobody knows we're involved in those processes. And on a, on, a, on a day when I'm not feeling so well, man, I just think, oh, why do I have to choose to do this, you know? Uh, where's the credit in this? Where's the kudos in this? There's not. You know what I mean? But but a great legacy. But uh, upon reflection, when I come to my senses, I am glad to have chosen this way. So, Dave, what's next for you? I mean, I, I can never see you as a guy who's going to retire, who's going to lay down. What What's next for you? Well, my wife has dementia, so what's next for me is to live this out as fully as I can with her, to practice what I preach anonymously, and to move from being a kind of more confronting, prophetic type figure to be more of a caring, pastoral person that she needs me to be. So that's uh, that's the what's happening now. I mean, alongside of that, ex- and, uh, I support other people who, like yourselves, has been in the church and parachurch organisations that have been done over really badly. I facilitate a number of groups where people like us get together and we talk. It provides a safe space for talk people to talk about their doubts, their despair. And not trying to fix each other, but kind of support each other. So that's that's one of the things I'm still involved with, supporting other people who've been really wounded by the religious tradition that I come from. 
there's a real power in that, Dave, in allowing people to be, yeah, just yeah. to sit and to be. Yeah. Um, and I know that's that's something that you are definitely a champion of. And I think through all of the things that you've spoken about, you're with people. You've talked about how you have journeyed with people. You've met them where they are. You haven't tried to change them. You've you've walked with them. You're walking with with Ange right now as you know she, she with with dementia and and I know that you've you've got some great community around you and I, I'm sure that that is something that you've built do you have hope for the future about where the church can go or is it all lost and it's up to people outside of of church grounds I'm not committed to big C church I'm committed to small See church of small groups of people gathering together to share their faith and their doubt, to draw from the spirit and example of Jesus and to reflect on how that can help them shape their lives in response to the struggles that they're located in. That's what I've chosen to focus on and um, yeah, for most of my life. And that's, uh, yeah, that's where I see the future. I mean, I just find it so tragic that to see churches defining themselves over against the most vulnerable minorities in our community and to see that as witnessing, I find that heartbreaking. I, I just think uh, if that church like that does not continue, it would be a blessing to everybody. That's not because I've got it together, I don't. I'm with people that know they don't have it together, but at least we know we don't have it together, <laughs> and that's less damaging to ourselves and other people. Yeah. One of the other things I'm involved with, by the way, is uh, which is unbelievable. Sitting, I've had to withdraw from 90% of my external community engagement to be supportive of Ange. So I've, I was invited to write some training materials for imams, and they asked. They said, "Look." We're being oppressed by increasingly extremist fundamentalist Buddhists in um, Thailand, Myanmar, and Sri Lanka. And you know, if we if we can't find a constructive way of responding to this and kind of react against it, then the same thing is going to happen to us as happened to the Rohingyas uh, in Myanmar. So, can you write this material to help us look explore how we can be Muslims in today's world? Uh, in and be confident in our faith, but not feel the need to fight anybody about it. Can you can I, can you help us reflect on how we can respond to their criticism, to their attacks? Can you help us think of how we can read the Quran in a way that um, draws the, the the spirit of compassion from that tradition, rather than be used as a justification for uh, militancy? And can and can you help us explore ways of um, developing partnerships with uh, non-Muslim groups. I mean, to, for me, to be invited to do that as a Christian is absolutely incredible. And I had three world-class Muslim scholars commit themselves to helping me with this process. And just a month or so ago, there was a meeting who brought together all the peak leaders of Muslim organisations and invited a sheikh who is a global expert to come and to be a part of the Zoom conversation. They read all my materials, gave me feedback on it so graciously, and said, I've actually run your course on what it means to be a Muslim in today's world. Because <laughs> I love it. This is what it really means to be a Muslim. And, and, and the sheikh said, can I take this material and use it back in Nigeria, dealing with um, young Muslims who attempted to go with Boko Haram? I'm going, how wonderful it is that I could immerse myself in this community and be so appreciative of that, that community and so supportive of that which I find there that reflects the heart of God that I can communicate that to them in a way that resonates with their hearts and affirms the best in their tradition. Now, that's unbelievable that in my circumstances where I'm just totally withdrawn, have very little involvement, that I can be involved in that frontline struggle with people of another religion 
and be supporting a spirituality of compassion that could be really, um, really significant for them in the way they deal with their persecution. So isn't that amazing? And I think that's the thing that, that stands out in our conversation with you, Dave, is it tra- everything you do transcends the tradition people may come from and who they, the God may, they may, may identify with. And the real thing is love. Yeah, it's, it's love for your fellow humans. It's support for your fellow humans, and nothing else matters. And and I think that's a really beautiful thing. And it's a beautiful thing that you have embraced. That certainly you've you've felt some pain from doing that, and you've you've been kicked out of of the community that should be responding with love. But to to the humility that you've shown to be able to continue in love to continue in support for your fellow humans, I mean, is is inspirational. Yeah, thanks, mate. Yeah, it's um, fortunately I'm not alone. There's lots of people of goodwill in every group, every tradition, every religion that uh, that encourages us, encourages us along the way, which is great. Dave, I hear you saying that you've retreated from 95% of, of what you used to do. Uh, uh. But if, if if people are listening to this and they're resonating with you, is there any way, and, and feel free to say the answer is no, but is there any way for them to connect with you or connect with your work? How, how would they reach out? Well, I've got um, a Facebook page, Dave Andrews, and I've just done a series on the Beatitudes on that, so that from my book, Plan B. I've also got a uh, website, daveandrews.com.au. They can contact that, and that's got all. It's got a whole lot of free materials, including the Idiot's Guide to Turning Your Congregation Upside Down and Inside Out, which is a good thing for Christians who are look, look, looking to subvert their their tradition. And it's also got all my music. People can access for free on that. It's got details about the books. Uh, that they can uh, they can buy. Then we I'm part part of the Waiters Union, so waitersunion.org. They can find out about on the and we're involved in a um, little evening service in the basement of an Anglican church in our neighbourhood at six thirty on a Sunday night, corner of Gladstone Road and Vulture Street, um, and that's a small little gathering place where we try to involve people from our neighbourhood who are struggling and give them a place and everybody who wants to can get a turn to speak and everybody who wants to can get a turn to lead it. So it's, it's church as community development, uh, as empowering people, um, not dominated by the clergy. So it's, um, it's a lovely little human scale celebration of the good news for the poor. And is that in Brisbane? Dave? That's in Brisbane. Yeah. Yep, I, I knew Vol- I knew Volta Street because of the Powderfinger album, so I figured it must. Yeah, have been that's Brisbane. right. Well, the Powderfinger guys used to live next door. Yeah. Ah, oh, there you go. So you know Bernard Fanning and all that. Did they ever join your community, Dave? They should have. Uh, great. No, but they found they found our cat that was lost, for which we were very grateful. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. And look, I do encourage people to to trawl through Dave's webpage. It does have a, a great sample of his music. You're a beautiful songwriter, and I think that you you write and sing from the heart, Dave, but also some of your great books, Can You Hear the Heartbeat, Christy Anarchy, um, Compassionate Community Work, Living Community, Plan B, which is you know, really about living those beatitudes, A Divine Society, so many more great titles that you've written and they are they are fantastic resources for people to tap into i think it's um it has been a wonderful chat with you and i think a lot of people will really connect with this chat and you may even um experience them reaching out to you i'd imagine was there anything i said that you particularly resonated with yourselves that that might have maybe encouraged you a bit because uh, we all need as much encouragement as we can get yeah, I love I love meeting Christians that are you know I talked about what Brian McLaren said about coming into that same place that place, place yeah, of yeah, love yeah. and place of compassion and I love meeting people like you Dave you know I call them spirit people I think that's what Marcus Borg used to call people like you that that are spirit people and and it doesn't matter what tradition they're from I've met people that are Jewish I've met people that are 
Buddhist, I've met people that are Christian. I, I have to admit, I haven't met people that are Muslim, but that probably says more about me than than about Muslims, meaning that I don't run into too many that are that are in that space or have even explored it. But yeah, what's really resonated with me is you're just another one of these these dudes saying saying good things about compassion and good things about love. And what you do is you make me go, oh, that's right. I don't hate all Christians. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, that's great. I'm glad to hear that. But good because the, the challenge is always to respond constructively to people in the tradition that you've been wounded by. That's much harder than it is relating constructively to people of other traditions and religions. Oh, totally, a hundred percent, and that's what I'm saying. I'm I'm quite open to to hear what you know Buddhists say. I'm quite open to hear what Jews say, and I, I don't give I don't give a shit most of the time what Christians say. And then I think the universe, God, whatever you want to call it, comes along and puts people like you in my face and says, oh, "Okay, you're not all bad." <laughs> <laughs> Great, that's a good outcome. See, that's that's perfect, Dave. Look, look, I think one thing that doing this podcast has has done has made us more empathetic more compassionate and we we certainly aren't christian haters we have our favorite christians and these people like you and brian mclaren well brian um, i mean how can anybody hate brian i people do but i just i just don't understand it he's such a loving and lovable person isn't he brian i just i think he's wonderful he challenges the establishment, Dave, as you as you do too, and that's why we love you because you you challenge the establishment, and and I guess that's what we we sought to do. And and as this podcast evolves, is it, it's about accountability, it's about educating people, it's about giving them information, and it's about giving them um, a space where they can they can be them, and that they can you know they can ask questions. They don't have to fit the mold and. You do that too. And so we just we want to celebrate the fact that you do that and thank you for that. Yeah, well, you're welcome. I, thank you very much for the invitation to talk with you. I really enjoyed the conversation and I wish you all the best in your future endeavours. Been, it's been our pleasure, Dave. Take care, guys. All right, Brian. Well, I'll see you next week and we'll do this all again. Oh, actually, sorry, in a fortnight we'll do this all again.